Uh, before we do get going, uh, please drop questions into the chat. Subscribe to our game-changing uh, weekly newsletter, the TRM, uh, TRM Weekly Roundup, and follow us on social media. And one thing that I would sort of ask a favor on today, this is, again, our first episode, sort of an experiment with this. We want to make this your show. We want to hit on the topics that are meaningful to you as uh, crypto investigators, uh, sort of in cryptocurrency uh, experts. So uh, drop sort of topics you're interested in into the Q&A or um, in the evaluation after the show. Please feel free to suggest topics for, uh, for future shows. And really excited to have you all join us for this very first episode. All right. No one wants to hear me today. Uh, let's, uh, let's sort of kick things off. Um, before, before we really dig into sort of typologies and trends and crypto investigations, um, we really do have an extraordinary panel today, some of the world's uh, really greatest uh, cryptocurrency investigators. And I'd love to, you to get to know them a little bit better. Um, Jennifer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick things off with you today. I uh, would love to kind of hear about your journey, uh, a little bit on your background, uh, sort of your, your superhero origin story, and a little bit about what you do at TRM. Uh, welcome, welcome to uh, TRM Talks Investigations, and uh, yeah, would love you to kick things off. Thanks, Eric. I'm excited to be here. This is my first time on one of your talks. So I've been <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, um, I came to TRM back in December. I'm really excited to come over here. And um, I came here from the FBI, where I spent 14 years as a special agent. Most of the time, which I spent as a cyber investigator, doing all types of cyber investigations. But towards the end of my career, I specialized exclusively in cryptocurrency investigations, and I was on the virtual currency response team handling international cases from around the world. And uh, a lot of those cases were major exchange hacks, SIM swapping, just all the, the big crazy cases that came to the FBI, I was able to handle. So I had a great time doing that, used all the, great, all the tools out there, and was really excited to make the switch over to TRM to get a chance to not just do the investigations that I was doing in the course of my career, but also to be able to help build tools that allow thousands of investigators around the world to learn the things that I had learned from the tools that I was building. So now that I'm here at TRM, I work on the, pro on the product team doing product strategy. And I see my role as helping to understand what investigators need to be able to do to understand where the emerging threats are and to build the tools that they're gonna need to meet those threats. So that's what I'm doing now. I love being on this team and surrounded by all these amazing people, and I'm excited to be here. No, I love that. I think what's, what's something so cool about your role at TRM is sort of like, obviously, um, you're a great investigator, but what you really wanted to do is sort of build the best tool for investigators, sort of that force multiplier. And I, th I th just think that's that's so cool, sort of a tool, you know, an investigator building the tool for investigators, um, which is awesome. Uh, Lisa, uh, you are up next. Superhero origin story, please. <laughs> Thanks, Ari. I don't know how I'm going to follow Jennifer, but... <laughs> I don't <laughs> um, like to follow Jennifer, Jennifer either. <laughs> Jennifer actually kind of paved the way for a few of us, I think. So like Jennifer, I came over from the FBI. I was also a member of the virtual currency response team. Um, I was from the FBI Sacramento field office where um, I worked a lot of different types of cases, um, primarily focusing on, well, first child exploitation cases and then dark web um, marketplaces, and then kind of branched out from everything that um, touched cryptocurrency. So I joined TRM in February. Um, like Jennifer, I also wanted to have you know, a greater impact in producing something um, that you investigate, uh, you know, as far as mitigating threats in that that system, um, so I joined the global investigations team in February, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, a I guess thing uh, across our door. So terrific! Yeah, no, thank you, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Monica. I'm going to move to you now. Um, you're sort of OG at, uh, at at TRM. I'm pretty sure you interviewed me uh, when I sort of came through uh, in the process. So uh, just super honored to have you on and uh, would love to kind of hear about your journey as well. Thanks, Siri. Yeah, I know it's it's crazy to look back and see how much we've grown. Um, but yeah, I so originally was in the due diligence com and compliance field. So worked at an array of firms like Exeger, Thomson Reuters and their finance and risk division, uh, which got bought out by 
the Blackstone Group and changed to Refinitiv. Um, and during that time was working on everything from traditional anti-money laundering related research to transnational organized crime and sanctions evasion. Um, and I kind of hopped over mid pandemic um, in September 2020 to join uh, what was a really small team at TRM, but also a super exciting opportunity. Um, at the time, what was our blockchain intelligence team? So, you know, scoping out the landscape of virtual asset providers, whether it's custodial services or traditional exchanges like Binance, Huobi, um, but also more on the illicit side of darknet markets and and other things that are out there of really making sure that TRM captured the breadth of what existed within the blockchain space. Um, and then about six months or so ago, I guess a little longer than that now, um, moved to the, uh, the global investigations team um, and got to work with these lovely people now um, on array of, you know, different topics. Um, so it's been a really exciting journey, almost two years at TRM for me now. Terrific. Yeah, no, Monica, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just, just amazing. Um, Taylor, uh, you're up next. Uh, just a little bit about sort of your journey and, and what's going on at TRM now. Sure. I love that Monica is the OG after about two years. I've been here <laughs> um, since like the end of March. And two, I already two years, like two years is 10 year. years in crypto. So it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, so I was lucky enough to work at the FBI with people like Jennifer and Lisa previously. I was there for about a decade, but it was really in 2016 that I made the jump over to pretty exclusively looking at cryptocurrency, especially through the, long, uh, the lens of anti-money laundering. Um, so I was more in this kind of headquarters capacity where I was helping to program manage cases across the field, um, help to create things like the virtual currency response team that we could recruit, you know, our amazing investigators and analysts and experts like Lisa and Jennifer to be on. Um, and so when I got this opportunity to kind of continue what I was able to do with the Bureau um, at this place where a bunch of people that I respect and, you know, really enjoy working with were, you know, also a part of, I, I really just jumped at it. So I'm also part of this, you know, amazing global investigations team, but really my main focus over here is being a training specialist. Um, so we have kind of an entire academy that we'll talk about later, um, certifications that we're offering, but really we just feel like a, a main part of TRM's mission to you know, protect this financial system is going to be accomplished through this educational piece. That, that's awesome, Taylor, and super helpful. And we will dive into that a little bit, sort of this this TRM Academy certification program. But it's just extraordinary to see what you and, and Rita, and we'll talk uh, to Rita in a moment, ha have built really over the last several months. Um, just really, really, really awesome, sort of a best in class certification program that we'll, that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Rita, um, uh, welcome uh, to TRM Talks. And uh, yeah, we'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your background before we dig in. Yeah, a lot of people don't know this area, but the U.S. Secret Service actually has a pretty unique mission in that, yes, you have both protection as well as investigations, but they also do a lot of training, particularly for state and local law enforcement at the National Computer Forensics Institute in Hoover, Alabama, of all places. And that's actually the reason why I um, came to be a, a Secret Service agent, and uh, I just kept coming back to the well of training throughout my career. I worked, um, you know, high value um, assets. I worked, um, you know, transnational organized cybercrime cases, which of course took me to crypto. So it was just one of those things that you just had to learn while doing. And I think it's so easy to forget that it really wasn't that long ago where, you know, no one to include awesome federal uh, law enforcement investigators, like we have some alum here on this call, um, knew what to do when it came down to like a live network intrusion incident or, you know, how to uh, de-anonymize like Tor uh, URLs, right? So yes, roll tide, Heather. Awesome. Um, so it's it's this upskilling that has to happen with crypto and moving to TRM, moved here in early February of this year. It offered me the opportunity to be able to continue to do investigations, like really just um, cutting edge investigations. I learned so much from my colleagues every single day, but um, also do, you know, this training that is so dire, so needed. We are getting um, so many requests from all over the world 
state, locals, federal, you know, uh, FIUs, everyone is looking for top-notch training right now because they're seeing this in their casework and it's exciting to be a part of it. That That's awesome. Thank you so much, Rita. And that's a great transition, I think, to sort of really dig into, as you said, sort of these sophisticated investigations. And, you know, I think uh, the reality is that we're, we're not living in a Bitcoin world anymore, right? Uh, Bitcoin was synonymous with cryptocurrency for so long. And we're really living now in sort of this cross-chain multi-asset world. Um, and you're, you, you need to have the tools um, to, to trace across blockchain. And, and Jennifer, I think that's sort of something that's really top of mind for so many of us and so many of our investigators today. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I keep thinking of a uh, material girl. I don't know why, maybe I'm losing my mind, but it's like, we're living in a cross chain world and you need a cross chain tool or something, but, uh, like h help us really kind of understand, um, sort of what's happening now in these investigations as they're becoming more and more sophisticated as, you know, illicit actors are moving funds in rapid succession across blockchains and how, how, how TRM uh, or how you're able to kind of build investigations still today. Yeah, of course, Eric. Yeah. Um, as I said, one of the things that I am just honed in on now is the emerging typologies and things we're seeing emerging in the, in the blockchain ecosystem. And so bridges and chain hopping are something that is just, it's been around, but it's growing very fast. Um, one thing that everybody probably already understands, but it, we should point out here, is that blockchains were, weren't designed, and they still aren't designed to speak to each other. Each one has its own ledger that speaks only to itself. So the connections between blockchains are not part of the blockchain as it is built. And we are now living in an ecosystem of hundreds and hundreds of blockchains. So these blockchains and the, the value that's stored in those blockchains in order to transfer across them has to have a way, it has to have connections that are not built into the chain. And traditionally, the way this has been done is through exchanges or various types of trading services. But now in the last year, we're seeing the emergence of this new structure called bridges. And bridges are designed fundamentally to move value across blockchains and be the connectors between blockchains which is pretty amazing. When you used to move funds through an exchange or through a trader, you had to create an account. You had to have this multi-step process of being able to put your funds into this, this service and then change it and then move it out of the service. And that came along with a lot of AML and other sorts of friction that, that, that took time to get the, the, to make that connection. And bridges are almost automatic. There's, they're frictionless. You put the funds into the bridge and they move out on another blockchain, which is fast and easy. And it's great for an ecosystem that we want to be really interoperable. We want this, this, these stovepipe blockchains to be able to all connect so that this ecosystem of, of crypto really thrives. But it does lead to a variety of different issues. So now in this world of blockchains, we have more than 100, I think, of bridges that are out there. And these bridges have a lot of infrastructure built into them, including a lot of funds stored in them. So the bridges themselves now are becoming vulnerable. I think we saw that in this past, in this past year when we've seen all these hacks. There's been uh, at least four major bridge hacks in the past year. One just this past week with Nomad getting hit for almost $200 million, um, that, is, that has led to about a theft of about $100 billion in cryptocurrency. And, uh, and including the Ronin hack, which happened, I think, in March, which was $600 million alone. So these bridges and this infrastructure that's being built that's going to be a core part of the blockchain have a lot of value in them. And that value itself is being targeted by cyber actors. That, that, that's really helpful. I think one important thing to point out when you're talking about Ronin in particular is like, look, this isn't just hackers. And I, I shouldn't probably say just hackers, but, you know, this is a you know, nation state actor in North Korea uh, uh, seeing this specific vulnerability and attacking it and then sort of move and moving the funds. And we can talk about that in a moment, but that's sort of just, I, I think, particularly interesting um, that this is a place that, that sophisticated nation state actors are looking to go after now because there are so many funds and because they are so vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you, anytime you see, um, I think it's what, 7 billion when I last looked um, locked in bridges right now, because in order to enable the bridge infrastructure, there has to be funds stored on either side of the bridge to be able to allow to, to offer the liquidity for the movement of funds between chains. And so you have these huge amounts of, of crypto just sitting there, and that's a much easier target than stealing, you know, a thousand coins from a thousand people. You can steal all these coins from one bridge pool. So it is very vulnerable, especially to, especially, especially to sophisticated actors like North Korea and other nation state actors. Terrific. Yeah. Talk a little bit, if you would, about sort of how, how should investigators be thinking about cross-chain 
investigating um, today? How, how should you be thinking about the sort of capability of, of TRM or, or sort of these types of tools? Uh, well, I think what we're seeing now is, a, is an emergence of a new uh, money laundering technique, or it's, it's actually not really new. Like um, cross-chain hopping um, has been around for a while, but it has typically gone through exchanges and trading services. But now bridges are being used for cross-chain hops, which makes it faster, like I said, and, with, with, and more pseudo-anonymous. So it's more appealing to uh, all types of cyber actors, including the sophisticated nation state actors. And so investigators now, when they're hitting the edge of a blockchain, have to be able to understand that that is not the end of, best, end of their investigation. They're going to have to keep moving from blockchain to blockchain as they follow these funds. And, uh, and because it is, is easier enabled by bridges, they have to be able to uh, understand how that's working and why the, the actors are doing this. And so when we see um, chain hopping going on as a money laundering technique, and it's, and it's growing very fast because of bridges, there's a few reasons why they need to understand that the illicit actors are doing this. Uh, part of that is just because it adds complexity. When you are laundering funds across the blockchain, you want to just make it harder and harder to trace. And when you go from one ledger to another, you're, you're, you're actually adding complexity to that tracing process. So layering and, or complexity is one of the key pieces. Another is to access stable coins. Uh, we've seen over the, over the years that uh, illicit actors really love to be able to use stable coins because uh, it helps to hedge against the volatility in the market. They don't want to lose their money either, just like everybody else. So they, they pursue stable coins and they pursue stable coins on networks with low network fees. So when they are moving from one block to, to another, they'll understand that if they're going to have to move their funds a thousand times, every single time they pay a transaction fee, that matters. And so the network fees matters and, they'll go, matter, and they will go to blockchains with lower network fees, such as Tron. And then uh, another reason would be just the services available on a chain. If you are a cyber actor and you want to use a mixer, most of the mixers right now exist on Bitcoin. So you want to move funds that you've stolen on other blockchains over to Bitcoin to have that variety of mixers to be able to use it. Um, and also, sometimes they want to use particular services, services in countries where there's less uh, regulation. So they'll go to blockchains where they can access services, where they can move funds on and off chains, or where they can access wallets they like to use. And in the last case that, that you might see less set actors starting to use chain hopping and using bridges for chain hopping is just because they prefer to be in certain assets. They want to invest in a certain blockchain in a certain asset, and that's available on a chain. So all these reasons cause the actors to move funds very quickly across chains. Terrific. Yeah, no, that, that, that's super helpful. And before we sort of move on to sort of our next typology, because it's like just and, and just for our audience, really, today we sort of see as an opportunity for you to get to know, obviously, our investigative team, but also to sort of really quickly hit a number of sort of really hot button trends and typologies and then really kind of dig in later in in later shows and like spoiler alert i think this is this issue that jennifer is discussing right now is really top of mind and something that we'll take a really deep dive in probably the next uh the next year on talks investigations um but but lastly what maybe just sort of a quick example for folks uh jennifer that we're that we're seeing today that you're sort of using this um you, you, the need for cross-chain analytics um i think we can go back to the run and hack on this okay. I mean, that, that that particular investigation. Um, if if those people that people that have actually been following the funds, they'll see that there have been thousands of cross chain hops enabled by bridges used by Lazarus Group in that investigation. They are moving the funds back and forth across chains faster than investigators can even chase it. So if you were looking at traditional tools and having to hand trace and look at just block explorers and ledgers to be able to do that, you are struggling to keep keep up with the speed that this is moving at. So tools now need to be moving in that direction because it's moving fast and Lazarus Group is kind of leading the way in that in that area. That's um that that that's terrific. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for thank you so much for all of that. Um uh, Lisa, I'm going to I'm going to move to you now. Um sort of an entirely different uh trend or typology that we're seeing right now. Yeah, pig butchering. I got to be honest with you. I was a prosecutor for a very long time, over a decade. We were doing romance scams and other types of sort of fraud and and financial crimes. I'd never heard this term uh, probably until, I don't know, six or eight months ago. And now it's mm -hmm. just absolutely everywhere. And we're getting asked about it all the time. It's a horribly vulgar sort of uh, term to sort of think through, <laughs> but actually pretty illustrative to some extent of, of the conduct and what, what is going on here. Can you sort of walk us mm -hmm. through what this is? Uh, but then also, what does this look like on chain? Or how, how do you investigate this type of crime uh, on, on the blockchain? Yeah, sure, Erin. So... Yeah, like you said, um, we're kind of seeing this just really explode. So pig butchering scams, you know, I guess are sort of a natural extension of romance scams. Um, but, you know, we are seeing this make 
kind of the, the rounds around the news lately, and for really good reason. So individuals are losing 500000 a $1 million, $3 million and up. So it's really uh, extraordinary numbers. And they, they can kind of take several forms, but all involved the threat actor befriending the targeted victim and sort of gradually increasing the amount of money scammed from the victim over time so that eventually the victim is, quote unquote, you know, led to slaughter uh, with large sums of money. Oftentimes it's their life savings. And, you know, we're seeing a huge spike lately in these wrong number type of scam. So the individual will pretend to contact the victim by mistake, and then they will try to befriend them and get to know them. Uh, people also, of course, get contacted on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, dating sites, all of these different social media platforms. And often the conversation will steer towards investment or cryptocurrency fairly early on in the relationship. Uh, so once that scammer has made their way into the victim, uh, we see kind of a couple of different main umbrellas of these types of scams. One of them is the um, Ethereum liquidity mining pool scam. So, uh, you know, you earn your investment back by participating in a mining pool. Um, the other kind of major typology or umbrella that we see are these uh, broker investment scams. Um, so you know, like the, the older kind of scams where you have, um, you know, the, the stock investment platforms. It's kind of the same idea, but we're, we're talking about cryptocurrency instead. So of course, uh, once the victims put all of their money in and they want to realize their investment gain and they want to pull those funds out, they're told, oh, sorry, you can't do that. You have to have this minimum or you have to pay this extra fee, et cetera. And that's, of course, when they realize that they've been scammed. So when we start investigating these scams on chain, um, it starts to get very interesting and uh, very complicated. So as I've mentioned, these victims are being scammed out of hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars a piece. And of course, those victim funds get commingled into common wallet addresses. And the amount of funds going into these addresses are almost unreal. Uh, I would say like 10 to $20 million in each address is pretty common. Um, and some of some of the addresses I've been tracking hold more than $60 million. Now, some of those addresses with the higher figures um, are, are probably not getting all pig butchering scam proceeds directly. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next point, which is that there are two layers that need untangling on chain. So first, of course, we have those scammers addresses that receive the victim funds directly. And then kind of the next phase is the money laundering network. And that money laundering network likely has substantial overlap with the more um, you know, fiat-based underground banking systems in um, Asia and these sort of established um, you know, black market uh, money laundering networks. So we can make, you know, going back to investigating on chain, we can make some educated guesses as to change of ownership from our scammer to the money laundering network using you know, our traditional blockchain analytics. But this is really where our partnerships with exchanges and law enforcement is going to come heavily into play. Because of course they have insight into some additional details that we can't necessarily see on chain. So working with exchanges um, currently in my, my role here at TRM and previously um, through my work with the FBI, um, I know that the common pattern is that the victim funds will get deposited either in Ethereum or um, Tether or you know, USDT on the Ethereum blockchain first. Um, if it is in Ether, it does get converted right away to Tether. And then from there, you know, those wallet addresses, like I said, all those funds get commingled, and then it'll get sent out to the money laundering network or cash out points. Now, um, generally speaking, that uh, USDT on Ethereum, once it hits that exchange platform, it will get um, swapped for USDT on Tron. And then from there, it'll get either cashed out into fiat or it'll go on to other nodes within that money laundering network for further obfuscation. And of course, uh, Tron is chosen because of the low transaction fees. Um, Tether chosen because, of course, uh, it's seen as more stable than other cryptocurrencies. And I think there's still the notion in some circles that we can't trace it. Um, of course, we, we can trace it. So that's kind of an inroads into dismantling that network. So that's yeah, really and, kind and, of and, a pig butchering in a nutshell. 
Yeah, and at least I was just that, that's really helpful. And I was just going to say we got we got a question in the chat is, you know, many forensics tools currently do not track Tron. I mean, I think the the answer to that is, well, we do. Um, and it's yeah. becoming more and more <laughs> and it's becoming more and more important um, in investigations. Yeah. And what's what's cool, I think, is going back to kind of what Jennifer talked about. I mean, look, we haven't talked about Bitcoin in the entire course of, of your sort of discussion here. Um, and, you know, we really are living in this sort of multi-asset, multi-chain world where you have to have this um, this mm -hmm. capability. Um, you know, it, it's really interesting. You know, I, I was, uh, I love my pop culture and I was watching the Tinder swindler actually last <laughs> night. Um, and, and the reality is like, first of all, you could learn a ton about social engineering from that type of person and that type of activity. Um, but also there's no TRM mm -hmm. for that world that, that, that he was engaging right. in essentially. Right? right. Um, and the, and the reality is it just kind of shows the visibility we have now on financial flows, um, that we really, that we never had before. Um, in sort of the traditional world, um, and and it's not like this is new. The sort of the the romance right. scam type of type of right. thing. No, that's that's that, that's really helpful. Um, it it what's what's cool too is that we hear so much about what the social engineering piece, but very little about what an on chain investigation um, looks like. So so thank you so much. That that was awesome, um, Monica. Uh, sort of ju jumping around a little bit as we were going to do today. Uh, you have been you know, not sleeping, essentially investigating, uh, investigating discord hacks over the last, you know, really couple of months. Um, and what we've really seen is a proliferation of attacks against NFT related, uh, projects in particular, uh, you wrote a great piece for TRM insights that I, I would encourage everyone to, to read on our website. If it's not in the handouts tab, um, on, on this issue, can you talk a little bit about what that investigation entailed and why it's sort of something that, that, um, we're focused on or, or crypto investigators today should be focused on. Thanks so much, Ari. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today, even though they're different subjects, has a lot of crossover. So, you know, speaking of the Tinder swindler and the scam era that we're in, it's not something new, but it's something that's happening at a completely different scale. And one of the main factors of that is kind of this you know, identity and trust you can build through social media. Um, the Federal Trade Commission themselves had published a report for a review of 2021 saying that, you know, in the last year, $770 million um, was stolen by scams promoted on social media and instant messaging platforms, um, making it one of the most lucrative places for scammers to go to today. Um, and so I'm going to talk about Discord, which is one of those and arguably within the crypto space, um, you know, the kind of the most popular and go-to place specifically for Web3 developers um, within crypto and, and how there's also been, you know, as there's been this movement of popularization of this platform, it's also been ripe for exploit by, by scammers and other illicit actors as well. Um, in this slide here, so this is a persistent threat we've seen targeting um, NFT communities on social media in particular. This is a snapshot only of, you know, events that occurred within June specifically and only a specific week of June. You can see that, you know, within a day, either around, you know, multiple or, or dozens of different NFT projects in particular were targeted um, and compromised. And we'll get into kind of the, the nitty gritty of what that compromise looked like. But it's just the fact that, you know, this has been happening as we moved into 2022 in the new year. This started to happen at scale. And so for the past couple of months at TRM, we've been really tackling and looking into, well, what are the projects that are on a daily basis being targeted? And, and now at this point, you know, looking into the source code of, well, what's being sort of moved around and reutilized and duplicated as tactics as to, you know, how these communities are, are being penetrated. And as you can see, you know, the consistency and scale at which this is happening hasn't stopped. Um, this week alone, there's been a number of compromises. Last Friday itself, there was 10 compromises that occurred within a single day to the same, you know, a, a different set of projects with the same source code being reutilized. Um, and so, you know, looking into how these work, um, with Discord in particular and why it's been so successful for these compromises to occur is the fact that, you know, the very nature of what makes the platform so great. The fact that 
you can have a server, a project can have a server which has multiple channels and you can see the administrators of those channels. You can see the people with, with roles, with implements, with permission um, within those different servers. And so, you know, that's one aspect of within Discord, which can also have, you know, within a server, hundreds or, or even thousands of people per server kind of following and, and discussing different types of activity Attackers can also identify who those influential and key individuals are within that platform and, and compromise their account and through social engineering, promote a fraudulent message to the whole entire server of, you know, playing on FOMO, playing on urgency of we have a limited number of NFTs give for a giveaway and, you know, it ends today at five or whatever that time may be, but, you know, creating that sense of urgency for a user to click into that fraudulent link that they're promoting on that compromised account of someone who's probably an admin of the platform. We've also seen this happen through DM, but at scale, uh, it's been happening within, you know, compromising an influential person person's account um, and promoting that message. And then with that, as a, as a user or, you know, potential victim, they'll click into that link when they click into that link, they're they're brought to a separate domain that prompts them to connect their wallet. In most cases, it's usually a MetaMask wallet, which will then, you know, they'll they'll send an initial minting fee. But when they connect their wallet and send that fee, it's activating a set approve all function or, uh, you know, other syntax related to that steal approve NFT targeting ERC 721 tokens in particular and routing them directly into the address associated to that fish. Um, and so that's what we're seeing happening at scale. You can see here kind of what that looks like. So as an individual clicks into that account, their wallet is compromised and approving all, you know, a full drain of the NFTs that they hold within that wallet that they've just connected. Um, so here you can see a different set of wallets that were compromised and the specific NFTs captured here on TRM um, that were able to visualize these NFT transfers. So we see really well-known um, projects that are being targeted, such as Board Ape Yacht Club, Mutant Yacht Club, Goblin NFTs, Ghost NFTs, Other Side. Um, so, you know, NFTs that range in value from as much as 40,000 to 100,000. Uh, so it's, it's a really good way to target and, and you know, make substantial proceeds as a scammer to target NFTs versus maybe another side DeFi service that operates or is promoting, you know, tokens that may not at a at a singular level have much intrinsic value. But if you are able to steal an NFT, for example, maybe a base, a board at Yacht Club NFT, through just the funnel of one drain of a single NFT, you could have a profit of around $40,000. So imagine, you know, if you're doing this at scale and compromising multiple accounts, um, and, and getting NFTs that are, you know, targeting projects that you know those NFTs are of significant value. If someone is kind of in the server of that Discord, they most likely probably hold some of those NFTs or others that are valuable. So after looking at those drained accounts, and again, we've re reviewed these compromises as they've happened at scale. So we're just keeping up with the fact that they're, when they're happening live, trying to capture that source code, trying to review, um, you know, if that fish address also has an account on a, an on NFT marketplace, is that account alive and active? Can we potentially help partners freeze that account so that they'd stop transferring out and or selling those stolen NFTs? Um, so that's that's one aspect of what we'll be working on. But then also in some of the more historical cases of doing sort of a you know post mortem of investigations, of looking at when those NFTs were sold and the proceeds came back to the attacker in Ethereum, where did that Ethereum move out to? So, you know, we've worked through tracing out main consolidation points that are shared among dozens of these different phishing attacks and compromises, um, meaning, you know, on our end that it's very likely that this is the same set of individuals that are running these attacks on a daily basis. Um, they've perfected the technique, they reiterate it, they target different sets of projects. 
a good portion of those funds they move into a tornado, but a, a a big chunk of those funds they also kind of you know have in in these other consolidation points that are are sitting there. There also are common cash out points that they've utilized as well um, among these different things. But one of our biggest things in investigations, at least, is to also cross check um, if there's any other. ENS domains or what we call off-chain information, you know, these other accounts, Twitter accounts associated um, to these individuals and their activities to really kind of create a holistic picture in our investigations um, and identifying not only the major cash out points, but also, you know, these internet personas related to these activities. Monica, I like the way you kind of, you know, wrapped everything together sort of at the beginning of your your presentation. And one thing to note, uh, even going back to Jennifer, who sort of kicked things off, is that when you're talking about the Ronin hack, right, it's been reported that that was social engineering, right? It was uh, North Korean actors, Lazarus Group or, or, or whomever, using social media, using LinkedIn in particular to uh, build a relationship uh, based on sort of a job opportunity with someone ho- who had access uh, and ultimately was able to get them to click on a PDF employment contract or something uh, to to sort of, you know, take, to, to take that over. So it's really... Um, it's really pretty pretty extraordinary um, to sort of you know tie th- tie things together. Um, Lisa, before I go go, go on to uh, to Taylor here, there was a question in the chat that I thought was a good one around sort of who particularly is perpetrating these these pig, pig butchering schemes. My understanding generally that it's sort of cyber criminal groups um, as opposed to necessarily uh, yep job offer sent to senior engineer. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know that. Uh, essentially um, cyber criminal groups or criminal organizations, uh, gangs, essentially, that are engaging in a lot of this activity. Uh, Anything sort of beyond that we should be thinking about? Yeah, um, you might have heard some stories in the news recently of, you know, like Thai nationals or these other um, nationals being held in camps, um, like, you know, scam camps, I guess you would say, but um, in Cambodia and a few other these these Asian countries. Um, so I think someone mentioned there'd be like fraudulent job offers. So someone will one of these job offers will go to like Cambodia and they will actually be like imprisoned and forced to work on these scams. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the off chain world where, again, where our partnerships will come into play to try to disrupt those networks. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And 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 there there's a there are a few questions uh, now. Three questions in the chat on mixers. Um, you know, tornado cash in particular. And I will say is that I'm going to take these for now as suggestions for sort of future shows. Uh, we are uh, obviously getting a lot of questions around mixing services as we're seeing sort of you know illicit actors, you, you know, North Korea and others sort of take advantage and, and use mixing services. Uh, to move funds. And we saw that in the, in the Ronin hack that Jennifer was talking about. And we've seen that in other cases. I think building a show around uh, sort of mixers and, and how to uh, investigate uh, mixers m- makes makes a lot of sense here. But uh, it is a huge topic that we could dedicate an entire show to. Uh, Taylor, another huge topic that we can dedicate uh, an entire show to, uh, wash trading uh, around NFTs. Can you so, sort of talk a little bit about this typology and maybe how you're thinking about investigating? Yeah, sure. So as you've noticed, we've talked about talked about NFTs quite a few times because they really are kind of this hot topic right now. Um, But what I will say, kind of going back to especially what Lisa was talking about, is that many of these kind of typologies and threat types that we're seeing, they're nothing new, right? It's just that we're taking these old schemes and using the cryptocurrency ecosystem to um, kind of perpetrate them. So traditionally, when you think of wash trading, it's really just a trader buying and selling, um, you know, a security or some kind of asset. Um, and really, the the main reason why they're buying and selling kind of just to themselves is to do this type of market manipulation, drive up the price, um, and really kind of um, you know make it seem as if this is just a truthful transaction. And so now. Um, NFTs are being used for the same sort of thing. And it's a really kind of easy place to take this wash trading because as um, Monica talked about, um, we really have this high liquidity within within this arena of NFTs. Um, So when you have the goal of kind of making quick money or uh, doing some kind of money laundering, uh, NFTs 
can be utilized uh, in that fashion. So not only are we seeing these scams, like with the Discord hacks and the pig butchering um, and, and, you know, some of these other mechanisms that um, Jennifer talked about for laundering and, and cross-chain hopping, we're also seeing NFTs kind of used as a form to do this laundering themselves. So basically what you would have happen is that you, for example, have $2 million in Ethereum. We all wish we had $2 million in Ethereum, but in this case, um, either this person wants to make even more money off of that ETH or they just want to hide where they got it from to begin with. So, Or, or, or take, Taylor, to stop, to stop you yeah. there, there's actually a great comment in the chat that okay. says, even worse, you take a flash loan for the 2 million ETH uh, and then go ahead and do that wash trading there where you don't necessarily have to even start with it. And that's kind of a, yeah, that, that's I, a great I point. I love that comment because yeah. actually the example after this includes okay. a flash loan, right? Because again, these are just these things that we've seen over and over in the past. We're now just using this digital art as this new way of kind of pumping up prices or something. So in just this generic example where you have that $2 million, uh, whether you made it through some kind of illicit activity or not, you know, you just made it on an, on an investment. Um, so if you could take that money, you could create, mint your own NFT, right? and then just sell it to yourself for that $2 million. So all of that activity is captured on the blockchain. So when the next person goes to look at, you know, what is the value of this NFT? It looks like, wow, people are willing to pay $2 million worth of ether for this. Um, so if I'm going to bid on it, I better, you know, be able to kind of come up with a similar amount of money so in this case, that that creator could either just use that as, hey, you know, it looks like on the blockchain that this address sent to this other address, totally legitimate kind of trade for the NFT, or they could take it a step further and just sell it to a third party market. And even if there was a 90% discount um, on what they were offered for it, they're still making this additional $200,000 for really doing nothing, right? They, they just kind of manipulated in the market into making it look like something was worth more than it intrinsically is. Re really helpful. Um, that's awesome. M moving on to the next example. Yeah. Yeah. So like the comment kind of mentioned, well, couldn't we just use a flash loan for these? So this is an actual example of that happening. Um, so there's a collection called CryptoPunks. Um, and so basically at the end of 2021, someone bought this CryptoPunk right here um, and they did it by just borrowing uh, money and then kind of just buying it from themselves and then repaying the loan in the same transaction. So that's what this graph is showing. This is all just one transaction um, basically up here. So they're not act actually having to pay anything at all. Um, and the, the kind of thing that really stood out about this that made um, the company aware that, that owns these crypto punks that mints them um, is that these were selling for, you know, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 at the time. The trade history of this one specifically was around that range. And this transaction at the time was for over $500 million dollars. So a little bit of a price discrepancy there that that flagged that for them, right? Um, Taylor, would you just on the right? Yeah. Taylor, would you just really briefly walk us through this graph? Because I think there's sure. probably a lot of people on today, and we have a honestly more than really ever uh, <laughs> on, on the line, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, would you just kind of? I, I think a lot of folks have probably not seen TRM. Sort of like what 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 does investigation just like look, just look like really quickly on the graph? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we always like to say in our trainings that what happens on the blockchain stays on the blockchain. And this is the perfect example of that. And also the fact that when we're doing these investigations, we're able to kind of take this on-chain data and uh, combine it with off-chain data to really make rich blockchain intelligence. So this is taking a lot of those aspects that are just kind of open source reported, and then also what's happening on the blockchain. You'll see again, no Bitcoin to be seen in this example either, um, because NFTs need to be traded on blockchains that allow for smart contracts, which Bitcoin um, is not one of those. It's you know kind of more 
just for doing those uh, kind of traditional transactions. I guess we can call it traditional at this point since Bitcoin's been around for a while. But so in this example, the two blue circles on here are the, the buyer and the seller, which again, are just the same person. Um, and so you're able to, to kind of see their portfolio of assets when they do these transactions. And you'll see the ownership um, of these different, uh, of this CryptoPunk NFT kind of uh, going through this transaction here. And then all of the other um, kind of circles on here and their um, these darker colors because they have pretty high risk scores. So you can, uh, as you might expect, there you know some other kind of uh, suspicious activity going on around those. Um, but this is just kind of showing the process of the flash loan, of the use of decentralized finance, of the use of decentralized exchanges to really make this transaction happen. Um, but all that is really being seen on the outside of things is like, hey, this person sent it to this person who bought it for $500 million, because it's definitely, you know, what we believe this to be worth. And so this actually, the ability to do this analysis, especially on chain, um, like I was kind of starting to say before, the creator of these CryptoPunks noticed this huge anomaly um, and they actually tweeted about it because they said, you know, this is really indicative of something suspicious happening here. And this is something that we'll be, you know, setting filters for um, in the future. And so that's something that we do here um, at TRM as well. We really are interested in doing these kind of risk assessments on NFTs. Um, so when someone is making some kind of uh, big investment, we'd like to see, you know, is there any activity that happened in the past that maybe would note some kind of, you know, illegal laundering activity? Was the NFT stolen? Was there some kind of exploit? Um, so all of this can be done kind of within our forensics tool and then paired with some of this, you know, just information that you can really just get out in the open as well. Taylor, that's awesome. Uh, super interesting. I think Rita's answering a question, if I can tell, in terms of off-chain data. And I think we've gotten to a bunch of that already. But one, one thing that's kind of, and I think you also answered another question that I thought was really good, is how do you detect wash trading? <laughs> how, do, how do you detect wash trading? And I think the answer to that is you start to really understand what are these typologies on chain um, in order to be able to sort of detect these types of, this type of activity. Yeah. Um, is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, it right. is. Okay. And I, and I, and I, there's a bunch of other questions here, but like we are literally rocking and rolling, which I knew we would because these topics are so good. Um, and you guys are such experts. Um, so I think we're going to, uh, I think we're going to sort of jump, jump ahead yeah. a little a, bit. A lot of it yeah, does have on. to do with that. Yeah. With that price anomaly, really looking at, you know, is this a tight group of people that have ownership of these NFTs? Um, are we seeing really, it, it's really about like statistical discrepancies. Um, and interestingly, um, although this, um, <laughs> right, doesn't, yeah. No, no, keep going. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just kind of understanding, like you have under here again, like uh, the, the, the question around- We'll just have um, to talk about this another time. Let, let's totally talk about it another time. We can, we'll, do an we'll entire, we can do entire uh, TRM talks really on NFTs and some of the typologies around them, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, let, let's talk about sort of our, our, our next and, and, and final topic. Uh, Rita, this is uh, not a new topic. Uh, in fact- I don't know if there's been a time that I've been in this space that we were not talking about ransomware. Um, but, you know, look, trends and typologies yeah. change and actors become more and more sophisticated. Um, you have really dug in. I, I've seen you present sort of at the highest levels on, on this topic. Um, would, would you talk us through a little bit uh, about sort of ransomware and maybe some things we're seeing today? Absolutely, Ari. So you have this then and now. You have this pre-2018 where if you wanted to launder the proceeds of your ransomware activity, you really had to know somebody. You really had to have your professional money launderer in your network. You had to come to the table with quite a lot of um you know, money to launder, right? It was this very specialized, high friction kind of process. Whereas now you have ransomware as a service. So you have relatively low earning and low on the totem pole folks who still need access to um, ability 
to launder those proceeds, right? Um, now, perhaps the most frustrating, and this was also frustrating when I was in law enforcement, that victims actually have a, uh, a really increased level of access to crypto, right? There's almost this entire secondary market that has sprung up to be able to help victims in that time of an, a ransomware incident, right? Um, so I, I understand the need for that, but obviously if we're looking to kind of shut this entire thing down or or make really impactful inroads in this activity, um, then you know it's, it's that kind of all sides of the coin that we have to address. Um, where there were just a few laundering services before, now there are many, um, and we have just an increased level of access for even someone who um, is, is just looking to launder a relatively low amount of funds. Um, I have a, a rather complicated graph. This is actually a graph after uh, Lisa's own heart. Um, she is infamous for creating like these very complicated graphs. But basically, we see this entire cottage industry of these high risk virtual asset service providers that have emerged strictly to, you know, launder the proceeds of your ransomware. Um, there is a, you know, quite a bit of success and um, a string of sanctions that have happened for exchanges who are doing ju just this, ChatX. So Rita, Chad to clarify, exactly, yeah, we're talking about ChatX and SUEX and Garantex, sort of those now sanctioned by OFAC uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and really sanctioned for this, just this reason, right, for allowing the proceeds of ransomware to flow through. Exactly. And the beauty of being able to do this kind of virtual asset service provider due diligence at any spot in time on chain is that we as investigators, we can see it. We're not having to rely on, you know, banking records or quarterly questionnaire answers like, no, we can see it in real time, um, which is, you know, exciting, but also to some level frustrating because there are some places in the world where this activity, um, you know, as FATF likes to say, no one is outside the scope of their regulations, but there are some places in the world where they seem to be getting away with a lot. And, you know, earlier you had this kind of Icarus moment with Colonial Pipeline. And I think these actors, especially um, in response to geopolitical events that are happening around the world right now, they know exactly where to stay to continue to make as much money as they have always made, but not gain as much attention. So there's some rebranding happening with Conti specifically, but ransomware is still here. It's going to continue to be here. Um, and these actors are, you know, chain hopping, using stable coins, stable coins on um, alternative chains like Tron to cut down on those gas fees, just like in the off chain world, gas is expensive for bad guys too. Um, but all of these trends that we've been talking about and all of these other threat areas, um, the same is true in ransomware. Still here, still going to be here, unfortunately. But I think my biggest thing is um, we got to focus on actors, actors, not variants, because this breaking up of variants, these guys are not loyal to a particular variant. It's not like that typical street gang kind of mentality where they're going to, you know, they're going to be Conti till they die. No, absolutely not. They just want to make money. So we got to focus on actors. We got to build our cases around those individuals when and where we can. Rita, thank you so much. I've not heard it described that way, but I, I really like it. it. It was really what you're saying is essentially dark side uh, had their kind of flying too close to the sun moment when they just went too big. And really, we've seen a little bit of pulling back in terms of these high profile attacks to make it actually easier and not have the FBI or whomever sort of quite as fired up about about going after them. Is that sort of where we are with this? Yeah, and I think this definition of what includes critical infrastructure continues to change and rightfully so. I mean, I th I think that's the government being nimble when and where they can. Um, but these guys are going to continue to test those boundaries. And they're really, really great at just kind of flying under the radar where they can. Um, because no one, no victim wants to admit that they've been victimized, right? It's like a, it's a time of high stress, high shame for those victims. I, I totally get that. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we got to make some disruptions here or else this is going to continue to go on for another, you know, five years. Um, yeah, no, th thank you so much for that. And again, like, I think ransomware is probably another show it's an entirety in fact we've done it before uh not so much the on-chain tracing but sort of a conversation around ransomware where we had carol house from the national security council and sort of you know subject matter experts in the space um we've had awesome suggestions i don't think i've ever had as many great questions in the chat in the trm talks in 30 plus shows uh so this is unbelievable um and we are going to try to get to each of them whether it's in creating a new show there's another great suggestion which is to create a chat where folks can interact with each other which I've seen before, but we have not um, used on this platform. It's a great idea. I think it will be challenging my um, sort of ability to keep up, uh, which uh, I am not a great multitasker, as my wife will tell you, but uh, that, that's a great suggestion too. And we'll try to do our best to, uh, to figure that out. 
uh, before we wrap things up, Rita, uh, Taylor, would love to sort of just get two minutes from you on sort of TRM training certification, because that's really so much of what this is, is that up leveling uh, level, you know, piece uh, that folks can kind of take some of these, these, these insights that you guys are giving and will give in the future uh, to sort of help in their own create, you know, build their own expertise. Yeah, so part of that is our TRM Academy. We have this huge vision for TRM Academy to be the place where anyone, whether you're in federal law enforcement, whether you're on a threat intelligence team in the private sector, whether you're a grandma who wants to buy some Ethereum for the first time, comes to educate themselves so that they can feel confident in you know, doing these uh, transactions and, and doing these trans, uh, excuse me, investigations. Um, Taylor specifically has created just some incredible content that is um, far and away better than anything that I have done uh, before. I think a lot of us coming from federal government, we've sat through a lot of really terrible trainings and that was a big motivator to build something really special with CRM Academy. Um, but we're so excited about it. Uh, it is, it's meeting people where they're at, both at their level as, where, as well as this idea of something that's self-serve. You can do it on your own time. Um, we work with a lot of seasoned professionals, whether that's in risk management, compliance, investigations, who are like, hey, I, I know my job. I know what I need to do. I just need to know crypto. And we're able to offer that to them really quickly. That, that, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And how, how should people, folks get in touch with us? I mean, you can DM, DM me, DM uh, Rita, Taylor. Uh, you can email us uh, or uh, honestly, like in the uh, in the evaluation at the end of the uh, of this TRM talks, please, please put that in any other ways that they should be reaching out. Well, yeah, I mean, I know that a, a huge thing for people, especially when it comes to cryptocurrency is getting certified. Um, so really feeling like you took that information in and really understand what's happening. And so we've been really excited to offer a few different certifications with probably the most popular so far being this certified investigator. It's really about not only you know knowing the fundamentals, but how do you put that to work in an investigation? And whether that means you know a true kind of federal law enforcement investigation or you know a compliance effort it's all kind of the same pieces that that build that true investigation or just kind of for personal due diligence as well um like Ari, you know you were talking about for for some of these uh scams that we're seeing um happening to people or these nft risk assessments so these certifications are something we're currently doing live um we'll have self-paced options in the future but th this is a really good opportunity to you know fully um, kind of understand the landscape and, and what you can do here. Uh, terrific. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and then lastly, look, I mean, almost every one of you today hit on frauds and scams and really sort of this proliferation of of uh, of activity in, in the crypto space. Um, we, you know, we, we've done it with with really tremendous partners, Binance US and Circle and, and, and um, Ave and, and others have created something called chain abuse, which is really, uh, you know, I think of it as a ways for, for, for crypto hacks and scams, right? A place where we can crowdsource information. So, so, so bad stuff doesn't happen to other people that's happened to you. And also so a place where law enforcement and others can go to investigate this stuff. So, so check that out. Um, check that out as well. And, um, and a absolutely. Um, look, before we wrap up, uh, I would love to sort of, you know, in our three minutes left, and I know it's like zero time, uh, would each of you sort of just give sort of one sentence that you'd love folks to kind of take away today uh, from, from what they heard? Uh, Jennifer, sort of starting with you. Sure. I just want everybody to remember that this is not a single blockchain world. It is a multi-chain environment. Don't stop at the edges. A good investigator is going to push and understand that you just flow from blockchain to blockchain. And if you hit a, if you hit a barrier, you just find your way through it. The connections are key. Lisa, what should folks know about pig butchering? Lisa looks slightly frozen. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll give it a try. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, my secretary headset is on. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me is just really, you know, not forgetting the marriage between this on-chain and off-chain activity. So in the case of the Discord compromises and really scams at large with all these different social engineering tactics, it's, you know, all, a lot of these individuals have ENS domains, they have accounts, they have Twitter handles. And, and so really, you know, bridging off, obviously following the money, but seeing where else do these people have legitimate, um, you know, accounts that they have followings and, and other individuals connected to them. Uh, so just, you know, marrying those two, two things is important. Awesome. Echo and all, we got you. Uh, Taylor, go for it. 
I'll just give you one sentence since we're running out of time. Interested in investing in crypto? Do your due diligence. Love yeah. it. Rita. When it comes to ransomware, actors, not variants. When it comes to training, there's no stupid questions. The gate's open. Come on in. Awesome. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Look, I, I am incredibly proud uh, to uh, to work at a company with with just incredible subject matter experts uh, like we were able to have on, on TRM Talks today. And thank you for to the audience. Uh, this was really, really, truly extraordinary. Um, and yeah, thank you for all of you out there in this community that's helping us build a safer financial system. And uh, as, as I said at the outset, this is going to be a monthly show and we want it to be your show. Uh, so as you're struggling with issues or questions around crypto investigations, uh, please reach out and let us know what we should be talking about. Uh, so until next time, uh, subscribe to the Roundup, uh, reach out, uh, do some training with us. And um, really, thank you for joining us for our very first TRM Talks Investigations. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Aaron.